heartbroken. Hollywood star Alec Baldwin shoots dead a woman on the set of his latest film. He says he's in shock after the accident, with questions still unanswered over just what happened. It left cinematographer Helena Hutchins dead and the director injured. I'm really shocked. It's, a, it's unbelievable she just had that kind of rare sensibility when you meet somebody and say, I don't even need to see your work. I can tell already you're going to be a, a genius. Also tonight, time for plan B. Scientists tell the government that more deadly COVID variants could be on the way without decisive action before the winter. The palace confirms the Queen spent a night in hospital, but only after it was revealed by a newspaper and... Welcome back to Leo's Animal Planet. Today we're going to be... The young at climate Peter. crusader who's caught the eye of none other than David Attenborough. This is the ITV Evening News with Charlene White. Good evening. Hollywood actor Alec Baldwin is at the centre of a police investigation tonight after accidentally shooting and killing a crew member on the set of his latest film. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins died after being shot by a prop gun while they were working on the Western movie Rust in New Mexico. The director, Joel Souza, was also wounded and was treated in hospital. Baldwin posted a statement online tonight talking of his shock and sadness over what happened. From the United States, Robert Moore has the latest. This was the movie set here in the deserts of New Mexico that last night became the scene of a real life investigation that has shaken the film world. Good morning. Ahead on CBS Mornings, a prop gun fired by actor Alec Baldwin kills a crew member and injures another on a movie set. Alec Baldwin was seen in a state of visible shock, apparently aghast at what had happened and talking on the phone. He was both starring in and producing the film. It was on this set that the stunning lapse of safety occurred. A prop gun was fired by Baldwin with horrifying consequences. Director of photography Helena Hutchins was killed and film director Joel Souza was lightly wounded. Hutchins posted this video of herself from the movie set just two days ago, relishing the scenery. Friends today reacting in horror. I'm, I'm really shocked. It's, a, it's unbelievable that Helena, who was a rising star, a, a young woman, um, died in a way that's unfathomable and, and shouldn't have happened on a, on a movie set. Um, she was an incredible talent, and I, I think we're all trying to understand how this could have happened. I did a movie with Helena just last year that had a lot of gunplay in it, and Honestly, we didn't even use guns that fired anything. They didn't even fire blanks because it's possible to replace everything with CG and just use guns that make noises. So at this point, especially um, with all the concern we've had for the safety of people on sets, it's, it, it is, it's really bizarre that they would have been in a situation where a gun is being fired unexpectedly with a projectile in it. Fatal incidents on set like this one are rare, but not unheard of. The actor Brandon Lee, the son of Bruce Lee, accidentally shot in the head on a film set. Production on the film has now been halted. When or even if it will resume is uncertain. For now, family, friends and the film industry are grieving the sudden loss of a talented young cinematographer. Shaken, this could happen at all. Well, Robert is at the ranch where it happened. And um, Robert, what did Alec Baldwin say in his statement tonight? Well, the film set is just a couple of uh, miles up this ranch road here while the investigation uh, goes on. There is no suggestion, it must be said, that this is anything other than a tragic accident. You saw those... Uh, anguished photographs of Alec Baldwin uh, by the roadside here and he has issued a new statement saying there are no words to convey my shock and sadness regarding the tragic accident. I'm fully cooperating with the police investigation. My heart is broken for her husband, their son and all who knew and loved Helena. We are though still waiting for the local sheriff to explain not only uh, what happened here at the ranch but above all else how it could have happened. Robert, thank you.
Here, the government's scientific advisers have warned it's better to act early to stop the rise in COVID infections or harsher measures could be needed in the winter. They've suggested that asking people to work from home could be the most effective option under the government's Plan B in England. It comes as the new variant called Delta Plus is already showing signs of spreading more easily. Here's our political correspondent, Carl Dinan, on the concerns. The Prime Minister is counting on the contents of these little glass files. Seven, yeah. eight, yeah. nine. So long as the vaccination programme can keep hospitalisations under control, he does seem willing to bear a greater number of COVID cases. We're seeing uh, high levels of, of infection, but they're not outside the, the, the parameters of what was predicted or uh, what we, we thought we'd see in the, in the autumn and winter plan. But it's very important that people do follow the guidance, follow the guidance on general behaviour, on being cautious, on uh, wearing masks. For now, all that is just guidance, nothing more. But the scientists at last week's SAGE meeting warned that earlier intervention would reduce the need for more stringent, disruptive and longer-lasting measures and say the reintroduction of working from home is likely to have the greatest individual impact on transmission. Today's figures show another 49,000 cases were reported, the seven-day average up more than 18%. And while the number of patients in hospital remains well below January's peak, it is up again to more than 8,000. But scientists seem concerned about what might happen without further intervention. We've learned time and again in this pandemic that if you realise you've got to do something and then spend a week or two making up your mind to do it, you just end up regretting not having been more decisive sooner. We cannot just leave it to the vaccine programme to take care of this problem at this point in time. Uh, you know, it's making a massive difference, but it's not by itself going to be enough. Although there's been a measurable drop in social distancing behaviour, in Halifax, not everyone's ready to discard the idea of restrictions. Do you think the rules are strict enough at the moment? No. People think it's finished and it isn't. 40 odd thousand a day. No. I've had both my jobs, um, but I'm still a bit unsure when I go shopping. I think we can't live with really strict rules all the time, but I think people need to do more themselves. And businesses looking ahead to Christmas would prefer lighter restrictions sooner. So if restrictions do come into force, I think they need to come in now, because if it's nearer to Christmas, it can be devastating for small businesses. So if they are going to put any restrictions in, now would be better for, for us all, I think. You'll also need a COVID-19 booster. But for now, the government hopes the booster programme and the existing guidance will be enough. Carl, but the government's still reluctant to bring any restrictions back. Yeah, very much so. They have great confidence in this booster programme. In fact, in the last few minutes, they've announced 500 mil 5 million sorry, booster jabs have been given. But the scientists advising the government are concerned that whilst hospitalisations for COVID at the moment seem quite manageable, there are potential risks. For example, the virus has some way to go in its evolution. There could be new variants which cause a, a much more transmissible virus. And of course, then there are the normal winter pressures that the NHS comes under. We don't know how many people will need to go into hospital with things like flu this winter and those could knock this off course which is why I think scientists are clearly concerned uh, that the level of infections should be kept under control ideally by lighter touch restrictions now rather than having to go for something much tougher later on in the winter. Okay Carl thanks very much. A week after the death of Sir David Amos, people in Leon C in South End have come together to pay tribute to their MP. The two-minute silence was held by the local community to remember him. He was killed while holding a surgery in his constituency. The man accused of killing Mr Amos appeared at the Old Bailey today, charged with his murder. A provisional trial date has been set for early March next year. The Queen is back at work and undertaking light duties after spending Wednesday night in hospital for tests. Buckingham Palace said the 95-year-old is in good spirits, but wouldn't say what the preliminary tests were for. It also said that the Queen is entitled to privacy after being less than clear about the hospital visit, as our royal editor Chris Shipp reports. 
Today the Queen was following the orders of her doctors and taking things a little easier at Windsor Castle. She's even understood to be doing a little work at her desk. But at 95, the confirmation of tests and an overnight stay in a hospital bed raised alarm. Buckingham Palace gave few details but did announce that, following medical advice to rest for a few days, the Queen attended hospital on Wednesday afternoon for some preliminary investigations, returning to Windsor Castle at lunchtime, this is Thursday, and remains in good spirits. Preliminary investigations clearly means early investigations. In this particular age group, it usually means just a first line of tests that you couldn't necessarily do at home at a patient's bedside. So maybe scans, maybe x-rays, or maybe some blood tests that need to be looked at within a hospital setting. Certainly everyone at the reception the nights before her hospital visit said she looked well and the decision to send her for tests was clearly taken at the very last minute on Wednesday. But the Queen is not one for staying at hospital overnight. Despite her age, the last time she needed to was in 2013 for a stomach bug. In fact, it's unlikely this week's hospital visit would have been announced at all had it not been leaked to a newspaper. We're now in a phase where how much the palace are going to tell us, the people and the media, about what's going on is clearly being worked out. And their instinct, and I think it reflects probably the Queen's own preferences, is to not say very much and to keep things back unless they become significant. Inevitably, these sudden, if precautionary, tests at hospital will raise questions about the Queen's engagements, both in public and behind closed doors. But 30 years after most people retired, the Queen will still be reluctant to agree to do less. Chris Ship, ITV News. Still to come the ITV Evening News. Could our Christmas dinner be saved after all? and the message to the world from the boy trying to save the planet. If we keep on polluting the oceans, we won't have clean water, and if we keep on killing animals, though there won't be any of these really lovely creatures. Those stories are more after the break. Welcome back. England's care regulator warned today that many people could be left without care this winter. There's a chronic lack of staff and those who remain are under so much pressure they say they're exhausted. The Care Quality Commission said urgent action is needed. Ben Chapman heard from one family who fear the worst. For those like Sonia who need care, the prospect of losing it doesn't bear thinking about. But she and her family have already been let down by two providers okay. this year due to staff shortages. Each time finding a new one was a struggle. And her daughter tells me their latest carer is now also preparing to return home to Eastern Europe. My mother's health is deteriorating, her, her mobility is deteriorating. And so th there is a genuine need. I'm honestly not quite sure what we'll do if we're not able to find that support. But the care regulator says the sector's facing a tsunami of unmet need this winter due to a lack of staff. In England, the job vacancy rate has risen from 6% in April to more than 10% in September. Burnout from the pandemic and post-Brexit immigration rules are among the reasons why. What we're seeing is, is, is providers are not able to offer particular types of care. They're handing back their registrations. They're not able to take people from hospitals. Uh, and that in turn means that people are staying in hospital much longer than they would otherwise have done. Right, all's got a double six. At this care home in Bradford, they had just one application for recent job vacancies. The regulator says urgent action is needed to create better career opportunities for carers. I don't think we're recognised for what we do. You can go elsewhere and do, I'm not saying an easier job, but a job where you can go work, go work just and then come home and you forget about it and they get paid a lot more than we do. The government has announced an extra £160 million this week to boost the workforce but insists it won't issue visas to bring more workers in from abroad. 
what we've said is we actually need to be responsible and invest in our workforce here, invest in training people, invest in paying people correctly, and really take this opportunity to do that. Plus, so you would say you're not investing nearly enough, that this is just a drop in the ocean? Well, you know, as I say, they haven't spent a penny of it yet. Social care will get an extra £5 billion over three years from the government's new health and social care levy. But that won't help people like Sonia this winter if there just aren't enough carers to care for her. Ben Chapman, ITV News. ITV News has learned that thousands of HGV drivers and poultry workers have taken up the government's new temporary visa scheme. Immigration rules were relaxed to help address the shortages of drivers and also staff in abattoirs. One farmer told us Christmas is saved. Our business editor, Joel Hills, joins me now. So, Joel, uh, what have you learned? Well, you may recall the government agreed to issue 10,500 temporary visas for foreign workers to help out British companies who are struggling to recruit in the run-up to Christmas. Now, my understanding is that around half of the 5,500 visas uh, that were set aside for poultry workers have been allocated and just under half of the 5,000 that were intended for HGV drivers uh, have also been taken up. Both schemes are temporary. They went live, Charlene, about 11 days ago. Poultry workers can stay in the UK until the end of the year. Lorry drivers can stay until the end of February. Now, the government initially suggested there wasn't much demand for these visas, but applications have clearly soared. Now, labour shortage has been obvious for months. You've probably seen the gaps on the shelves. They started appearing in supermarkets uh, back in the summer in June. Initially, the government refused uh, to relax immigration rules. Ministers says if companies want to pay people more, their recruitment problems would disappear. It changed its mind when news of a shortage of tanker drivers for fuel led to panic buying at petrol stations. Now, tonight, Paul Kelly, who runs the Kelly Bronze Turkey Farm, told us that the visa scheme has saved Christmas. It's a massive weight off our shoulders. We've been allocated 25 guys from Poland, he says. Hauliers, though, say they don't have enough lorry drivers to fill vacancies. Tonight, a Home Office source said it's pleasing to see that the time-limited scheme we set up is working the way it was intended. All right, Joe, thank you. Police say they've received 24 reports of people being spiked by an injection over the past two months. The alleged offences took place at both licensed premises and private parties. The National Police Chiefs Council say the majority of victims were young women, but that men were also attacked. Police have arrested a 24-year-old man in connection with the Manchester Arena bombing in 2017. Greater Manchester Police said the man was arrested at Manchester Airport shortly after arriving back in the UK on suspicion of engaging in the preparation of acts of terrorism. And former Labour MP Frank Field, who is now a Lord, has revealed he's terminally ill. His condition was revealed in the Lords when a statement was from him was read out in which he also says he now supports assisted dying. Next tonight, Melbourne's been celebrating the end of what's been called the world's longest lockdown. Residents of Australia's second city have been in lockdown for almost nine months now. But after reaching a vaccination target, the shackles are well and truly off, as Juliet Bremner reports. Midnight in Melbourne, the signal to pour onto the streets, celebrating the end of their sixth lockdown. <laughs> This was the sound of freedom rising above the city after a total of 262 days under nighttime curfew. Everybody good to be having a beer again. It's been a long wait. Some restrictions do still apply. A maximum of 20 fully vaccinated people indoors and 50 outdoors. Cheers. Cheers, boys. But it's a mighty relief. Mm. Just started. Just, start, just started. <laughs> See you Monday. Some of the biggest queues formed outside hairdressers. Another freedom introduced after Melbourne reached its target of getting 70% of over 16-year-olds vaccinated. For many, human contact as important as the haircut. This is what we do. We, we know it's, we're people people. We just like to be doing hair, mixing, talking, socialising. It's really important for us. People were heading back to the office, schools starting a staggered return the Australian Prime Minister welcoming Melbourne back to normal life. To all of those who are down there in Victoria today, enjoy the day. Um, it's going to be tremendous uh, being reunited again and doing all the things you've been looking forward to doing. They are just dipping their toes in the post-COVID world. Tourists are unlikely to be allowed back before the end of the year. But at least it's a start. Juliet Bremner, ITV News.
And finally tonight, the young conservationist whose campaign to save animals has won the backing of Sir David Attenborough. Seven-year-old Leo Sordello Savale set up his own YouTube channel during lockdown and has also inspired his classmates to protect our wildlife. Chloe Keady went to meet him. Welcome back to Leo's Animal Planet. Seven-year-old Leo wasn't going to let a little thing like lockdown stop him from trying to save the planet. Cheetahs. From his bedroom in South London, he's been all over the world. His mission? To make films about animals that he hopes will educate others. Rhinos are armoured giants. We've been making a lot of animals in the savannah and most of them are endangered. Then I just really thought that something needed to be done and that's why I started making these animal videos. Some of them are a bit closer to home. And I saw peregrine falcons. This budding documentary maker has even caught the attention of his hero. If we act now, we can yet put it right. Leo wrote a letter to the man that inspired him. He told him, I try to make my voice clear like yours. Please give me some tips. But perhaps Sir David Attenborough thought Leo didn't need any. Thank you for your letter. I am so glad you enjoy my programmes. I felt really proud that he took some of his time to write a letter to me. Leo now has his sights set on politicians and wants to hear what they say at next month's Global Climate Conference. What would you like to say to world leaders? Please, can you help if we keep on polluting the oceans, we won't have clean water, and if we keep on killing animals, though there won't be any of these really lovely creatures. Welcome back to... Leo says he wants to make everyone care as much as him. Chloe Keady, ITV News. Oh, bless him. Right, that's all from us for now. Raggy will have your news at 10, but for me and the rest of the evening news team, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.